Hold fast to the perfection of your faith. And not a building in San Antonio is going to hold what the Lord is about to do. Satan wants to make sure you never get this word. Satan is scared of this word. He has problems with this word. But I got a question to ask. Are you ready for the word? Because ready or not, here it is. Turn to Proverbs chapter 4, please. I'm just laying a foundation, brothers and sisters, for the teaching that we're going to do. You don't mind if I lay it nice and thick, because this is going to be some heavy stuff I'm going to be saying. Proverbs chapter 4. We're talking about religion or relationship. The restoration of Christianity, of the, of the Christian religion. The restoration. Because it's being chipped away, whittled away right now. Why? Because the boundaries are being changed. The ones that God established. Now God tells us what to do to protect the boundaries that he established for me and you about Christianity. He tells us exactly what to do to be able to protect the boundaries that he established for me and you about Christianity. This is what he said. Proverbs chapter 4, which you already know is in, written in the book of wisdom. Praise God. Because we get a chance to be wise as a result of what it is that he, 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 he said to me and you. Of course, chapter 4, you know, highlights and talks about how it's important for you to hear the instructions of the Lord. Hear the instructions of your father and attend to what it is that he said. Because he's going to give you understanding so you can understand everything he said. Because what he shares with you is good doctrine. And he wants you to be able to learn it too. Because in the midst of his law, ain't nothing but good doctrine. It's good stuff to be able to share with you what you need to know and what you need to do. That's why he's saying all you'll get in, you better hurry up and get some understanding. We're going to pick up at verse 20. He reads, my son, attend to my words, not the words, my words. That identifies which words we're supposed to be listening to. God's words. Because we're, cause we're his son. My son, attend to my words. Incline thy ear unto my sayings. And do, you, do you notice how he keeps sticking to my end? My, why? Because he knows that there's going to be all kind of sayings that's going to be being said. And he's telling you, no, you attend to my words. And you attend to my sayings. Not to what they say. Why? Because deceivers will be waxing worse and worse as the times continue. To the point that it gets you further and further away from what God wants you to continue. He said, praise you, Jesus. That was in verse 20. Verse 21 said, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. Why is that? For they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Therefore, I added the word therefore, keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips. Put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on and let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the the path of thy feet. Think about it. And let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Why? Because he wants you to remove thy foot from evil. Go back to verse 23. Keep thy heart with all diligence. Why that? For out of it are the issues of life. See, there are issues in life that he has placed in our heart through the sayings and the words and the teachings that he shared with me and you. That establish Ish that establishes boundaries for our life or what parameters in which life ought to be lived by me and you. That's why that word issues means exits, that is boundaries. Exits, that is boundaries. Like, for instance, in this building, we have various exits, praise God. Stuff comes in and out of those exits, praise God. People come in and out of those exits because those exits are access points to inside this place. In such a way as things get in because it got to come in through them exits. That's why God said, I need you to guard them exits to be able to make sure only certain things get in. Because other stuff get in, it'll tear it up. I was watching the TV the other day. I saw this one little video, praise God. You know, everybody do videos nowadays of the policemen. I saw one of police. I was interested, praise God, because, you know, we, 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 do, we do for the love of blue, praise God. We, we pray for the police, praise God. So when I see things for the police, my, you know, it perks up, you know, they, you know, I want to look at, look at it and see what they're doing. And they showed this one police, I don't know where they were, station, where the squirrel got in the, in the, in the, in, inside the police, you know, station. It was running havoc. A little big little squirrel, but it was running straight havoc. It was, you had police women screaming, stuff like that. 
Hey, man, I ain't going to get into that. I'm going to leave that alone, you know. But they were screaming and stuff like that. Ah, they were screaming like, like, this, like this squirrel going to kill them or something, you know. And they just run around tearing up stuff, jumping on stuff, knocking stuff down and jump, jumping on stuff and messing up stuff. And then they finally got him out into the little, little, little vestibule or the little area where you first come in, the end where the exit is. Where it's got where the doors on the outside and then you got the doors on the inside. And he running around there jumping up, knocking up against the windows and stuff like that and stuff like that. And he got this policeman with a gun on his side and a, bat and a bat on one side. And stuff. You know, and he, he like, you know, lean, you know, stand away, praise God. And, you know, he trying to close the door because they got them automatic opening doors. And he trying to get the door to close so the squirrel don't run back in. And, and then try to get somebody to get on the other side and open up the door so the squirrel can get out. You got all this stuff going on and stuff like that. Why? Because something got in that they needed to get out. And so they was focusing hard on making sure they get this out. Because although it was a little bitty, little cute little something, all a little cute little squirrel, it could tear up everything and disrupt everything that they were there to do. And God said, I need you to guard your heart too. Because you can let something get in there that'll tear up everything that will, and, and, and will destroy what it is that you, I expect for you to do. And you won't be fulfill, fulfilling what I got planned for you because of the exits, the issues that's in your heart. So that's why I need you to keep it. That word keep means to guard it, protect it, maintain it, and obey it. To guard it, protect it, maintain it, and obey it. I need you to keep it. And how do I need to keep it? With all diligence. That word diligence means a guard, meaning like, like a guard. Like a guard that guards a man, like a guard that guards a post, and a guard that guards a prison. Like a guard that guards a man. You might have been assigned to guard some man, get him safely to one destination or another, which means you got to make sure that don't nothing come up in there and stop it getting from where it need to go. You got to guard that man, which means you're not to pay attention to what's going on around you. You don't just, if you're there to guard somebody, you don't just be looking at everything else and just watching stuff, doing all kinds of stuff. No, you got to pay attention because you're there on an assignment. If you're there to guard a post, come on, military, you got to go back and forth and anything come up that ain't supposed to be coming up, you're supposed to say, halt, who go there? Identify yourself. And, of course, if they don't identify themselves based upon what it is that you're guarding, because if you're guarding something like, like nuclear stuff, praise God, then you also have been given the right to be able to exercise force up to and include deadly force, praise God, whereas you can drop them right where they stand if they keep moving forward, because you the man that's been put there to guard that stuff. So you won't be like them people on them TV movies where people can just walk in and steal a, a nuclear or warhead and all this kind of stuff. Man, please, you'd have got fired on by a whole bunch of people long before you got that close, praise God. Or a prison, where you're supposed to guard a prison. You're supposed to be guarding them people in the prison. Why? Because they're they trying to keep them in there. Because if they figure they get out, they're going to cause all kind of problems. Well, see, it's the reverse with us. We're trying to keep stuff from getting in here. That's in our hearts. That's why it said in verse 24, put away from thee a froward mouth and perverse lips. Put far away from thee. The word froward right there means perversity. So you got to put away from you perversity of the mouth. There's perversity of the mouth and perverse lips. That word perverse right there means perverseness or lips which speak perverseness. Is another way of phrasing it. Lips which speak perverseness. Now, anytime you hear things like perversity, perverse, or perverseness, it's always talking about something that's been twisted. Anytime you hear the word perverse, perversity, or perverseness, it's talking about things that have been twisted. Well, it means talking about anything that's been twisted or changed from its original form. Where God said, I put in your heart things that are the original form which set the boundaries of what it is to, that you're supposed to have and live your life and operate you like you're supposed to do. But you better guard your heart so that nothing gets in there and twists it and changes it and alters it and make it different than the way that I gave it to you. So it's no longer in the original form that I gave to you. That's what's happening in the midst of the body of Christ right now. That's Satan's attack to the body of Christ is to be able to interject into heart perversity or to sense things in the heart to twist it from its original form, change it from the way that God originally intended to be, change it the way from God said it, it to me, you and me, so that we can now live our lives according to perverse, twisted thinking that the devil caused to happen in the middle of our life, 
which will never cause things to happen like they're supposed to happen in our life. You, we still, most of us, we still use keys to get in houses and stuff like that, praise God. Satan's trying to take that away from you so he can have access to your house anytime he wants to, praise God. But right, you know, and we go along with it so that we can just say, you know, you know, Siri, open my door, please, you know. So a devil can, can come back later and say, Siri, open their door, please. Praise God. We don't even understand what we're doing. We just be cooperating with stuff and don't even, leave it alone, Rodney. Don't even go there right now. Praise God. Some of us, we still use keys, though. Praise God. But imagine your key is designed to be straight. But imagine, for whatever reason, somebody comes along and twists your key. A little. Not even a lot. Just a little. And now you go to open your lock. It won't open now. Why? You can't even get it in. It was not, you, the same thing that was designed to open doors for you now can no longer open doors for you because it's got twisted. You might be wanting to lock your door. Praise God. You might be in New York someplace where you got 14 locks up and down and stuff like that. Praise God. Pause button. How many people want to live in a place where you got to put 14 locks up and down the door? Praise God. Anyway, leave that. I'll tell you something right now. First time we're coming, I think we're going to move here. And then they, they bring you into an apartment, and then you look, and they say, well, wait, why do we have 14 locks up and down there? And they say, because you're going to live in New York. So no, I ain't. <laughs> Praise God. Said, Hallelujah. Because if I got to be a place where we got to put 14 locks on the door, oh, that's all right. That's how, I live someplace else. Anyway. <laughs> Devil must be running roughshod up in that place. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway. One of the many ways that he does that. Oh, by, by the way, going back to that lock, you might have to use the key to lock your door. But now you can't even lock stuff out. Why? Because you can't lock it like you did before. And now he can get in and twain, change things and twist things from the way they're supposed to do. One of the many ways that Satan is attacking the church is to get people, including the church, to say about Christianity what he, Satan, wants them said about it rather than what God's once said about it. What Satan once said about it, rather than what God once said about it. So he can twist what we used to say about it to be what Satan now wants us to say about it. To twist what God said in his word about it to what Satan is saying through his mouth about it. Through his perversity of lips. And then he gets the church to come into agreement with it. And be walking around saying the same twisted, stupid stuff too. So that we can cooperate with the devil at getting done what he's trying to do and cause the church to no longer be what it's supposed to be and operate within the parameters that he gave it to. He wants to twist the original form of something and, or that's said about something that God has established. He, want, he wants to do that so that he can change the boundaries that God has established and thereby reduce, if not eliminate, the effectiveness of the most awesome thing that God established, that is Christianity and the church. You might ask, well, why is what said about Christianity in the church so important? How, how does that, how does what's said matter? You know, sticks and stones might break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Baby, you naive. And even more important, that's not biblical. Words are important. Muy importante. Turn to Proverbs chapter 18. Killing you softly with your words. Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18. Here, here, here the book of wisdom teaching us how kings are supposed to be kings. And, and, and so that we can be able to stay in charge and live large like we're supposed to. Proverbs chapter 18. Let's read verse 21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That's why God wants us to speak what he says about a thing so we can speak life about that thing, and it which speaks life into our life and allows us to know what parameter the way ought to operate in life because we're repeating what God said, the one who's always right. But Satan wants us to twist what God said Oh, he wants to twist what God said and have us say what he say about what God said so that death can manifest instead of life can manifest. 
Satan wants something said about something that'll cause death to come to it rather than life to be in it. And he wants the people of God to cooperate with him and help him to do it too. See, it's one, see it'd be one thing if the people in the world was doing it and the church would be you know, in absolute lockstep saying, no way, Jose, that's not it. But when you get the church to say the same thing as the world say too? Wow. Won't be long before it's through. Turn to Isaiah chapter 5, please. See, Satan wants people to call that which God calls good. He wants them to call it evil. And, and, and Satan has successfully gotten the church to be able to call things that God calls good evil. He has successfully gotten the church to call things that God calls good evil. You don't need to be there that long. God didn't say that. You don't need to be there that much. God didn't say that. How long is this service? God didn't say nothing about no long, how long service is. In fact, he said, give me the whole day. Are we still in the same day? Then where we got a problem here? The problem is, is what we think from ear to ear about what God said. Because many of us don't know what God said. We go along with what everybody else say. I need to hurry and get you out of here so that you can go back and, you know, do what you do so you can enjoy your day. That's what some preachers say. I need to hurry and get you out of here so, I can, so you can enjoy your day. As in, you being here ain't enjoyable, but I need to get you back out to what you really enjoy. God wants people to call that which God calls good evil. Why? Let's read. Read. Verse 20. It says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Or another way of phrasing it, they think they right. They think they just, this just, is just, just, just wisdom. It's just, just, everybody know, everybody say. God said, no, everybody. My people are supposed to say what I say. They're supposed to call good, good. And they're supposed to call evil, evil. But they're not supposed to be found calling good, evil. But the church is being found called good, evil. We call, we, we call that which God establishes good. Then we're doing what we're supposed to. But many of us are calling now calling God what God established as evil, as though it's something that's bad, something that's sad, something that you shouldn't want to be involved in, something that you shouldn't have any participation in. Oh, no, I'm not involved in that, even though we're Christian. Hebrews chapter 11, here's another one of the reasons why you answer, I'm answering your question about why it's so important, why words so important. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm laying a foundation, brothers and sisters. Starting with verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it, speaking of faith, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, of course, that's hearing what God has to say and believing it to the point that we order our lives according to it, act upon it, or do what we say do. Through faith, we understand that the words were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Ex nihilio. That's how he created it, you know, from nothing that existed. But notice, notice, notice. Through faith we understand, which means we understand this by faith. We wasn't there. We, we accept it by faith. That the worlds were framed by the word of God. That means that the kind of world that we have and live in is affected by words. The kind of world that we have and live in is affected by words. It's even created by words. It's, it's kept by words. It's protected by words. Or it's destroyed by words. Amen. He said the world are framed by the word of God. That word framed right there means to complete thoroughly. That is to repair. To complete thoroughly. That is to repair. So the worlds are 
completed and repaired by the words. Of course, in this case, it's the word of God. And that's what God tells us to do. I want you to say what I say. I want you to speak what I say. Why? So you can keep completing thoroughly the world that I've given you. And you can repair even the things that get messed up in the world that I give to you. Because the same thing I use to create it is the same thing I use to be able to put it back together again when it needs to be repaired. You're driving your bins down the street, praise God, and your transmission fall out. Well, you go back to the bins dealer and they give you another, well, not give you, they sell you another transmission, praise God. Hallelujah. And then you get it replaced. So it's repaired. The same thing that was used to put it together is the same thing that's used to repair it. Praise God. You got to repair it with the same thing, which is the words of God. So our world stays together by continuing to say what God says about things. Our world is framed by the words that we speak. It's framed. You know, there's a lot of building that go on here in San Antonio. Praise God. Sometimes you see houses built. I mean, when they build a house right across the street, praise God. I saw them lay the foundation, praise God. You know, they laid the slab of cement, praise God, and put the cement down first, too. And then after they let it cure and settle in, praise God, they start putting up the framework for the house. And you start seeing them putting up wood, and they start establishing the boundaries of the house. They knew the boundaries of where it was supposed to be before you could even see what it was supposed to be. So they put this edge over here and that edge over here. That's going to be the cornerstone of this side. And then they put that edge on that edge and that edge over on that side. And then you watch them begin to start filling things in based upon the framing of it. They start filling things in based upon the framing of it because it establishes the boundaries of that house, where the rooms were going to be, which room was going to be which room. You saw that ahead of time, but, but you didn't see it in its complete form but you saw it framed. Well, God says your, your whole world is framed by what I say. Your whole world is supposed to be framed by what I say because the boundaries ain't supposed to get changed. That's what Satan wants to do by coming in and changing what we think and say about something is change the boundaries. In such a way as I don't know how many rooms, but I'm gonna just make it up. It, it, it might've been a three bedroom house over there. But then imagine if they went to sleep and came back and somebody done changed the framing of it to the point that now it's a one one bedroom bungalow. <laughs> Imagine if before, praise God, it had was three bedrooms with two and a half baths. But then it got changed to one bedroom bungalow with an outhouse outside. Praise God. That that matters. <laughs> that, that matters. Especially, especially if you're taking a laxative. You ain't got time to be running outside and, you know, hey man, and going to that little moon room, praise God, and, and, and doing what you got to do. Praise God. You got time for all that. Hallelujah. One of the things I said Satan is trying to do, one of the things that Satan has been doing in his attack on the church is getting the, ch the world, getting the world, and unfortunately, Far too many Christian people to, of God to speak evil against religion and or being religious. To speak evil against religion and about being religion. In fact, he's getting people to see religion as being a bad thing. He's getting people to be able to see being religious as a bad thing. So that we can speak evil over what God calls good. So that we can then change our thinking on what God calls good and cause us to categorize it as bad. Something sad, something that you don't want to have anything to do with. He's getting people to see being religious or, or having religion or uh, as an undesirable thing for anybody to be or to have, including Christians. And unfortunately, he's being successful at it. I said he's being successful. I ain't lying. Have you ever heard anything or anybody say something like, you just too religious? You ever heard that? You're just too religious. As though being religious is a bad thing. There was a day, you know, I'm a little older than a few of you. There was a day when a person would not see that as bad. Speaking of the person that was being told that, you just being too religious. 
But fast forward to the year that we live now and say that same thing to a person that's in the church now. You just being too religious. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm not religious. Er? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But the problem is that Satan has successfully changed the definition of what religion, being religious is. And the church have bought into it hook, line, and sinker. To the point that we are walking around telling people, I'm not religious. I'm not. You ain't, you ain't heard that, have you? I'm, I'm, when I told one day somebody, God's going to let me preach a message to somebody, uh, somebody understand what I'm talking about. Nowadays, you have Christians responding by saying stuff like, I'm not religious. I'm Christian. Ain't nobody heard that? I'm not religious. I'm Christian. Well, how about this one? God doesn't want us to be religious. Christians. Christians. God's representatives, God's ambassadors, God's dwelling place, the place to shop where he do business. I, I'm, uh, his children, I'm not religious. God doesn't want us to be religious. Where Christians are helping Satan to get people and even other Christians to be able to think that religion and being religious is bad or wrong. Or how about this one? God isn't into religion. Christians is walking around saying that. God isn't into religion. Look at your neighbor and say, you're getting too quiet. You ain't. That, 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 it wasn't you, was it? Tell him it wasn't. It, it, it. Say if it was, don't say nothing. Don't say nothing. I'll cover you. Tell him I'll cover you. Don't say that. God isn't into religion. Well, how about this? Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with God. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with God. Everyone else has a religion. We have a relationship. As though it's one or the other. Because Satan wants to cause the thing that's supposed to be together to be separated into two separate things. Because now he can divide, he can conquer. He can start off with getting you to appreciate one and ignore the other and have nothing to do with the other so that once he get that one out the way, now he can focus all his attention on the second one and make sure that that one don't happen on that given day either until the point you know it, you ain't got nothing. And Christianity will be another one with form, but a, a form of religion, but no power thereof. Because we done went along and bought the lie that God isn't in the religion and Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with God. And because it's said over and over and over and over and over again by people both in the church, outside the church, it begins to be, people begin to start thinking that's true, causing Satan to win because it's been said over and over and over again. You know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words that are spoken, whether it's the word of God or the lies of the devil, if faith is established. And we are establishing faith in the wrong thing. And some of us have faith in the fact that I don't want to be religious. I don't want to be associated with having religion. I don't have religion. I have relationship. You ain't got no relationship. Well, you got a relationship, but you got relationship without fellowship. Because you don't even know what relationship means. Now, you already know I'm a you preacher. I'm not talking about you, so don't be getting no attitude with me when I keep saying you. It flows better that way. I could just go ahead and flow. Come on, can I flow? Yeah. And being said over and over and over again, people begin to think it's true, causing Satan to win. The world is now adjusted because it's framed by the words of our mouth, whereas instead of life, death is going to start manifesting. In fact, it already is. That's one of the reasons why we read over in 2 Timothy chapter 3. That's one of the reasons why all these things are on the rise. Because the church was put in place as salt of the earth. And salt is a preservative to make sure things don't get worse. 